All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our second installment of Paired on Air. Um, so our first one we had Marie Holvik um, and she was telling us about restaurant labor laws and compliance. And for this episode, we have Lindsay coming from Rich Table mm -hmm. and RT mm -hmm. Rotisserie. And we're gonna be chatting about restaurant social media and PR best practices. Um, so I'm Jamie, I'm going to be hosting and I'm on Paired's growth team here. And um, uh, let's see, some housekeeping things that I just wanted to go over is we collected a bunch of questions beforehand from our registrants. So thank you for those who sent those in. Uh, we're gonna do our best to answer as many of them as we can, but um, we can't promise that we can get to every single one. Um, and also for those who are joining on Zoom, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen where you can ask us your questions live. So if things come up, feel free to definitely do that. Um, and then again, we'll do our best to answer those. Um, another housekeeping item is if the internet cuts out, hopefully that doesn't happen at all. Um, stay on the line. We're just going to join um, using the uh, Zoom app. Um, and then we'll just pick it right back up where we left off. Um, and then with that, I wanted to introduce Lindsay Cummings. So like I mentioned, she is the PR and social media manager at Rich Table and RT Rotisserie in San Francisco. And before that, she was at Magnum PR, which is a boutique marketing agency in San Francisco that specializes in food, wine, and hospitality. So welcome, Lindsay. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Great. Um, cool. So I wanted to just open up the conversation and kind of set the tone for the state of restaurant, social media, and marketing today. Um, I was doing some research and I found a really interesting study from TripAdvisor that was published in 2017. And um, they have a lot of restaurants that are listed on their website, as most folks know. Um, but basically what they found was that 82% of restaurateurs named social media as the top marketing channel to invest in. And then at the same time, 85% of restaurateurs also feel that they should be doing more to promote their business. And uh, while that's the case, only 17% of those restaurants um, and restaurateurs surveyed, they have a dedicated marketer on staff. And then only 1% of those have um, outside agencies that manage social media. So there's kind of this attitude where restaurateurs are expressing a desire and um, they feel that it is important to invest, um, yet uh, perhaps the resources or the investment isn't quite there yet. And so um, with that, I wanted to turn it over to Lindsay to see what her thoughts are on this today. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that, you know, social media is this huge, huge tool that restaurateurs can be using to promote their business. But I think a lot of owners and chefs are kind of intimidated by the platform and that it's, you know, you have to invest time into it. You don't always have to invest money, but sometimes, um, and I think it is this kind of like seemingly daunting um, project to take on, but I think it's really worthwhile. Um, as Jamie said, I'm the PR manager and social media manager at Rich Table and RT Rotisserie. Um, so I handle all the kind of traditional PR um, activities like pitching stories to journalists, fielding inbound requests for photo shoots, interviews, um, keeping our website up to date, uh, company newsletters that we send out to our email list. And then I also manage our social media channels. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, I respond to all of our Yelp reviews. So kind of anything public facing I handle. Um, as, as Jamie mentioned in the stats, it is kind of rare to have a dedicated person on staff to handle all these things. And I think we'll get to a little bit of that in the end in terms of budgeting and um, how best to kind of go about that. But um, I feel very fortunate. I love what I do. I love the two restaurants I work for. And um, I think we have, we're building a really strong brand on social media. Um, so I'm gonna first start out with some kind of general best practices that we follow at Rich Table and our tier to three. And then we'll get into some of the questions that we've already received um, and kind of go down the line of um, suggestions for types of content to have and should you be working with influencers and kind of these big questions that people don't always know the answer to and they can always vary between different restaurants. But um, I'll share some of my tips and things that have worked really well for us and hopefully it will help some of you. Um, Great. 
So our strategy at Rich Table and our chair is has kind of started changing in the last few months since I started um, with the team. We were using Instagram specifically now as a tool to really share content. Um, and I think PR in a traditional sense is changing a lot as media changes. There are constantly layoffs at big magazines, magazines are closing, things are going more digital. Mm -hmm. It's just a really changing landscape. And of course, with that, traditional PR is changing as well. Um, it's, it takes a lot of time and energy to pitch big stories at national publications, and there's no guarantee of coverage ever. So even if you have good connections, you have a great story, you email it to the right contact, it isn't always guaranteed to turn into a story. So we're trying to kind of buffer that kind of uncertainty with PR and media right now with producing our own content on social media. So when it comes to Instagram, you know, we're spending a lot more time doing like Instagram stories that are series and, you know, making sure we're putting out really great content so that the story we would have preferred to pitch to a magazine, we might be actually, um, you know, putting out ourselves instead of relying on a journalist to write it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really fun for us. Um, in terms of strategy around how often to post, how much to post, it's, it, there's a lot of questions there. I think you have to have, you have to be really dedicated and you have to spend the time with it, but restaurateurs are obviously extremely busy people and right. don't always have a lot of time. Um, I think a general best practice in terms of posting is around once a day. Um, I think if you're doing an actual Instagram post in the feed, no more than once a day. If you're doing stories, I think you can do that throughout the day or you can do kind of a big block of a few slides at a time, um, depending on what you have time for. Um, there are plenty of studies out there that show that brands that post at least once a day get the most traction. They have more followers, they have more engagement, keeps people interested. So um, I think posting around once a day is a great strategy. Um, if, I think you can kind of choose between posting in the feed versus doing an Instagram story. I think you can do both in the same day, but if you only have time for one, just you know, do one or the other. Um, so Lindsay, what's your strategy when it comes to posting, um, when you're making a decision between posting something on a story versus posting something on the feed? How do you think about that? Sure. So what we do a lot with Instagram stories, specifically at Rich Table, is share kind of behind the scenes um, content. So I'll take people kind of start to finish from, you know, the first step of making a dessert to the finished plated dish um, and kind of every step that goes along the way. In the Instagram feed, I really want to share like beautiful finished content. So I'll focus more on like the actual finished dish versus behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I think when people look at their Instagram feed, they want to see pretty beautiful things. Instagram stories, I think, can be a little bit more off the cuff and kind of not as polished because um, it is supposed to be kind of a more immediate, instant thing. I know Instagram started as like, you're supposed to post immediately, but mm -hmm. hardly anyone does right. that anymore. Right, so exactly. um, I think Instagram stories is a great, a great way to kind of show the, the fun side or the sillier side or the less polished side. But in the feed, I'll post like the beautiful dish. Mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of, so posting at least once a day is great. In terms of Instagram stories, I think there's also, you can do too much at one time. Um, no one is going to like flip through a hundred slides of an Instagram story. No one really has time to watch that because there's, you know, people are following hundreds of other people. There's a lot of other stories that they want to watch. So I recommend keeping it around 20 slides at a time. Um, if you have a lot of content and you really, really want to share it all in Instagram stories, just break it up, make it a, you know, series or a multi-day post. Mm -hmm. Don't share it all at once. If you really want to keep that engagement up, people aren't going to click through that many slides. So I came across this problem recently. We were doing um, an Instagram story that I called a day in the life of rich table. And it was sharing kind of from 7 AM when the first prep cook gets there mm -hmm. all the way until 1 AM when people are, you know, cleaning and leaving the restaurant, what happens every hour throughout the day. And I realized I had way too much content to share like, no one was going to watch this whole story mm -hmm. start to finish and that defeats the entire purpose of that mm -hmm. type of video so 
um, I was chatting with Evan, our, our owner, and he said, why don't you just turn it into a series? And, you know, it made total sense, I think, to break it up into mm-hmm. multiple days so that, A, it doesn't overwhelm people, that you don't get super bored with watching, you know, this super long story. And then also it keeps people coming back a few days later to watch the rest of it. And we got a lot of messages that were like, wow, this is so fun. I can't wait to see the rest. So yeah. it, it keeps people coming back. Right. So I saw that series as well, and it was really cool. I loved seeing the like hour by hour kind of behind the scenes look at Rich Table. It was yeah. really cool to uh, get under the hood, so to speak. Um, how did you know that folks were less engaged when you put um, more content up? Like, what were the signals that you had? Sure. Um, I think watching the viewer numbers go down every time you click to the next slide mm-hmm. is definitely the first indicator. That's natural. That's going to happen no matter what story you put up. Not everyone is going to watch every single slide. I'll put up, you know, three sometimes on my personal Instagram and the drop off is like 20 people each slide. Obviously with a bigger brand, there's going to be more drop off. That's normal. Um, don't be discouraged if that happens, but definitely if you're seeing like the first slide have a thousand views and the last slide have a hundred, you probably have too much content up there and people are getting bored. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just not the right kind of content that resonates with your viewers. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that a lot of what we do at Rich Table is experimental. Like we we're finding out what people are interested in who follow us and then kind of, you know, executing our content from there. I think that not everyone is going to want to see wine photos or cocktail photos or dessert photos. You have to really kind of play around with it, throw stuff out there and see what resonates and then kind of, you know, execute from there. Um, In terms of that, we had a lot of questions come through about how to keep content new and interesting. You know, we've seen a million photos now of the same avocado toast. We don't need to see more of those. So how do you, how do you come up with new and engaging content for your followers? Um, I think it's all about looking for inspiration. I think that you know, follow, like follow professional food photographers, see what kinds of angles they're getting or, you know, spreads of beautiful tablescapes, um, follow food photographers. I do think you see a little bit more or food, I mean, influencers, excuse me. Um, I think you see a little bit more of like the same content reproduced there, but sometimes you'll find someone who's doing something truly unique. Um, look at food magazines, you know, see how their professional on staff photographers are arranging food and, you know, kind of don't copy what they're doing, but use it to inspire you to think differently about the way that you're photographing things. Um, yeah, I also think there's something to be said for uh, looking internally too. I don't know mm-hmm. if Rich Table does this, but I'm sure uh, within your own team, there's things that you you all notice that are uniquely Rich Table that you can kind of play up. Yeah, yeah. Um, our chef de cuisine, Brandon Rice, um, has he his Instagram is great. Um, he he takes his own photos of the dishes he creates and he's found this like perfect segment of a a wooden table in the corner with the perfect light and there's like a little notch in the wood and he's kind of taken that as his his personal style um and so we do kind of emulate that sometimes too and that's that's kind of like the rich table sort of look sometimes Mm -hmm. with these finished dishes on that perfect wood table with Mm -hmm. the little the knot in the wood so um yeah it's i think that you do want to be careful about not reproducing the same content too many times, but I think there's also something to be said for creating a really strong and cohesive brand voice and like a very cohesive style as well. So that if someone sees a photo of a dish or, you know, the way that the food is on the table, like they're like, oh, that's Rich Table. or Oh, Mm -hmm. that's, you know, this Mm -hmm. restaurant and they recognize it. So I think having a nice balance between those two of not doing the same thing over and over, but making sure that it's consistent is a really important balance to strike. Um, and like I said, in terms of content suggestions for not just doing the same old avocado toast photo over and over, you know, think about things that people don't get to see in the restaurant. That's what we've been doing a lot of at Rich Table, showing these behind the scenes, you know, Sarah Rich working on a dessert, you know, all day long and recipe testing or you know coming up with a new dish and things that people don't get to see when they come to your restaurant because when they're eating at your restaurant they're seeing the beautiful plated dishes so it's nice to see that in the feed but show them things that they don't get to see on a daily basis and that they may not know even at all about the restaurant industry you know i have friends who watch the rich table instagram series of a day in the life and they're like wow people get there at 7 a.m we have no idea you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. i think it's 
it's been really fun to see how people have been responding to that. And it's been really interesting for people to kind of learn these things about restaurants that they didn't necessarily know. So I think, yeah, just play around with it, experiment a little, you know, see what sticks, see what people are responding to, see what's getting likes and comments and what people are DMing you about when you put content out there and then run with it. So when you are doing series at Rich Table and we're getting a peek behind the scenes, um, how are you interacting with other staff at Rich Table? Are you kind of getting buy-in to say, hey, here's something that um, I think would be a great angle for us. Uh, would you want to help me? Or are you more like on the, a fly on the wall, just grabbing snapshots around, um, around the kitchen? How do, you, how do you approach it? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, sometimes I always sit um, in a certain corner of the dining room and I work from the restaurant all day. Um, and sometimes I'll just see someone doing something cool and I'm like, I just kind of run over and take a few snaps and like, you know, that's it. And then other times if I'm working on a specific video of a dessert start to finish and working really closely with the, you know, the chef that's working on that plate and, oh, what, when are you working on, you know, this component of the recipe? When are you making the crumb fresh? When are you doing this? When are you making the ice cream and kind of really kind of standing side by side with them and watching them do everything they do and taking a million photos and you know so it really varies of if i'm just kind of like popping in behind the scenes or if mm -hmm. i'm really kind of taking control of the situation it depends if it's like a an actual video that i'm working on i'll i'll make sure that i'm working more closely with the chefs and the front of house staff and you know everyone to make sure that it comes out great but if it's just something cool that someone's doing in the background you know i just kind mm -hmm. of grab it really quick right so you said you'll pop in and take like a million photos mm -hmm. so do you what's like the ratios so you know how when you post one thing there's probably yeah. been a bajillion takes of it yes um <laughs> do you have like a ratio that you have found tends to be successful when you're posting on instagram um that's a good question i i definitely go i take way more photos than i think i'll need <laughs> um so like I said, if I'm doing an Instagram story video, I'll keep it to around 20 final slides, but I probably pare that down from around 250 photos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it actually does take a lot of time to kind of storyboard these Instagram stories and make sure that they, they make sense start to finish. You're getting all the steps of the process. Sometimes you have to cut a few photos, even if you really like them and just kind of put it in the caption of the slide of like, and then we do this and just kind of move on to the next one because like I said you don't want people to get bored mm -hmm. um but yeah each video that I do on Instagram stories I probably take over 200 photos for and then either combine them on the same slide or you know just really pare it down mm -hmm. but sometimes in the moment you think you've got a really great shot and then later on you're looking at it it's blurry and you didn't realize it or the lighting was off and you didn't realize it so always take way too many <laughs> you can always cut it down mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's, it's definitely go for, go for too much. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, we also got some great questions about how to keep your guests engaged. Um, and I think, like I said, making sure you're producing really great content that they're interested in and responding to is step number one. Um, but I think there's also a lot of fun things that restaurant marketers or owners can do to keep guests engaged. It depends obviously on the style of your restaurant, of what makes sense. Some of these things won't necessarily make sense for a fine dining restaurant. They might be more geared towards fast casual or you know, kind of uh, less formal environments. But um, I think it's great to run you know, contests and giveaways every once in a while. Um, when Rich Table released their cookbook last fall, we did a giveaway for a signed cookbook. Um, we've done contests at Archie Rotisserie and given away you know, ice cream or french fries. And, it's easy to do those things. It keeps people excited. They want to participate. Um, and it just kind of helps spread the word too. If you're doing a contest where the only entry you have to do is tagging three friends in the comments, then those three friends who may not have heard of you now have heard of your restaurant. Um, I think it's also fun to do polls in Instagram stories of, you know, you can even ask your followers, what kinds of content do you want to see? Do you want to see food? Do you want to see, you know, in the kitchen? Do you want to see sandwiches or do you want to see salads? Like it's, you can ask people what they want to see and get feedback that way. Um, and then I think there's a really, there's a lot of value in using user generated content. So we do this a lot at RTO23, um, which is sharing and reposting content that diners have posted. Um, I think that 
A, it's hard to always come up with your own content. So using content that people have taken at your restaurant is a really great thing to kind of buffer those days where you may not have anything specific that you want to share that day, but you still want to, you know, share something to your followers. So, and it also keeps your diners and your guests excited to take photos of your food and put them up on their own pages or on their stories because they're like, oh, maybe they'll share this and people will see it. And if, you know, they're an up and coming food photographer, blogger, influencer, you know, they're very likely to want to kind of have that co-promotion. So I think that's a really valuable, you know, piece of content you have out there is what your diners are posting. Um, we do that all the time. I think that, you know, it's, no one can come up with the, the perfect post every single day. So, mm. ha, you know, having kind of that bank of content is really helpful. Also, when you're, you know, kind of starting out in terms of how, you know, how much to post, you know, you have to think about the content that you already have at your disposal. So if you only have, you know, 20 professional photos taken of your food and you don't feel comfortable with your own photography skills, then you can't post all those 20 all at once. Right. You have to spread them out. And this is a good way to kind of fill in the gaps of making sure that you're posting enough, but um, not using all of your content all at once. Mm -hmm. um, we also got some questions about how to maintain traffic on your page and how to make social media an everyday habit. A lot of, like I said, a lot of restaurateurs are extremely busy and social media, while it may be a very important thing for them to be doing, is not their top priority when they're trying to run a business. Um, so I think that it is possible to make it an everyday habit, even if you don't have a ton of time. I think take five, 10 minutes every morning, you know, check your DMs, respond to comments, at least like every comment that you're getting like all the photos that people have taken of your restaurant and posted on social media, and then post one thing, you know, one story or repost something that someone else posted or one photo that you have in your back pocket. And it literally takes five to 10 minutes. It's not, you don't have to spend all day on social media. I do, because that's my job, <laughs> but like most people don't have time to do that. So, mm -hmm. and that's totally okay. You don't need to respond you know, all day long in 30 seconds. Um, if you have time for it, great, you know, but I think spend five to 10 minutes every morning, do that. And then if you have time throughout the day to give it a quick check, maybe at the end of the day, do another check-in, respond to DMs you've gotten, respond to comments, and just make sure you're staying present, but you don't need to be on it all day long to have it be a valuable tool for you. Um, there are also plenty of apps that you can use to schedule content. Um, there's apps like Later and Planoly, um, Tailwind. There's all these different great apps that you can use. And previously, they weren't able to actually post automatically for you. Now, mm. some of them are able to. So if you really don't have time to post it yourself, take one hour every week, plan out the whole week's worth of content and all the posts you're going to put up, and then schedule it into one of those apps, and it'll do it for you. You don't even have to think about it. I think you should still check your DMs and your comments, but you don't have to actually sit there and post it. You can spend one hour and do it all in one block of time rather than checking it every day. So in your experience, let's say I am a restaurant operator and then I want to plan ahead and just slot things in uh, for the week so I can kind of set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. um, do you have thoughts on, um, based on your experience at Rich Table and also Magnum, uh, what are the best times of day for posting? And then also yeah. like for what kind of business? I'm assuming if you're a bar, you'd probably not want to post about your drink specials early in the morning or. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think pl planning around the right time of day is really helpful. Some of these apps actually help you decide what time of day is helpful based on your own followers. Um, Tailwind I think is one specifically that recommends certain times of day based on your own analytics. Um, but yeah, I think if you're posting about a cocktail, 7 a.m. is not the right time to do it. I think, you know, happy hour time or later in the evening is great. But I think also look at your own Instagram analytics. If you are a business profile, which if you're a restaurant, you should become a business profile immediately because, you know, then you can have all these tools at your disposal that are free. You don't have to pay for an app that gives you this information. Um, so you can just click on the little insights tab on Instagram and it'll tell you the times of days that your followers are most active. If it says, you know, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., then, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I think midday is usually better, but people are checking their apps on their phone on their way to work, you know, and or while they're bored at lunch, you know, so I think kind of midday and on is, is the best time to do it. Um, 
then again, you should also pay attention to where your followers are located. If you have, you know, if you're based in California, but all of your followers are in New York, then, you know, kind of play to those time zones. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, use the Instagram insights tab. It'll tell you when your followers are active. Use one of these apps that suggests the times based on your followers and kind of go from there. Um, again, this is something you can play around with. You might find that posting midday just never gets you any traction. And then all of a sudden you post at 6 p.m. one day and you get a ton of likes. So I think it's something you do have to experiment with a little bit on your own too and find out what works for the people who are following you. Mm -hmm. um, great. And then, so we've been chatting a lot about Instagram, but um, restaurants might also mm -hmm. be on Facebook, on Twitter, um, other social media. And so I'm wondering if you have sort of like a decision-making framework in regards to which ones to use for which types of content. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to Facebook and Twitter, we don't do a ton of proactive posting on either of those apps, um, mm -hmm. mostly because when we do, I find that people aren't as engaged on those platforms and it, it doesn't go as far as it would on Instagram. Um, I think that also when it comes to Twitter, our following there is just a lot less than it is on Instagram. So you're getting less engagement automatically from less people. Um, so when it comes to Twitter, we tend to share a lot of articles that we get written about in. Um, if journalists are sharing those on, our, on Twitter on their own pages, we'll repost or retweet um, those articles. Any mentions we get will retweet. I tend to like every tweet that anyone mentions us in, but I don't post original content on either of those platforms because um, I just don't think it's worth the time and the energy for us to put you know, energy into that. Um, I think that if you already have a huge following on one of those platforms, absolutely, you should be posting original content there. But keep an eye on the likes you're getting, the shares, the reposts, the retweets, if you're just feeling like the engagement is super low, then it might be time to shift the strategy elsewhere. Um, for us, we just already have a really huge following on Instagram, so it makes more sense to cater to those followers, whereas Instagram and um, Facebook are a little bit less so. Um, we also got some questions about hashtags and whether or not to use them and if they're helpful. I think absolutely every restaurant, every brand should be using hashtags. You don't have to use them in the main caption though. I think some people think they look tacky or like you're trying too hard or whatnot. So I think that um, if you don't want to use them in the main caption and kind of keep them hidden, that's totally fine. But what you can do is as soon as you put up a post, you can write a second caption beneath it and include all the hashtags there. And it won't show up unless people click to see more, uh, more captions or more comments, excuse me. Um, but take an eye, keep an eye out on what other brands are using. There's, you know, the infatuation eats hashtag. There's, you can hashtag, you know, eater SF or whichever city you're in for eater. There's all kinds of different hashtags for food out there. Um, just keep an eye on what people are using and what people are responding to. Look at each hashtag and see how many followers it has. Sometimes it's better to use one that's a little bit more proprietary. Um, rather than one that millions of people contribute to because if someone's looking at that hashtag, they may not see your content. So, but definitely use hashtags. I think every business should be using them, um, but just use the ones that resonate with your particular business. And if you want to keep it a little more uh, classy, you can use it in the <laughs> comment below. Right, yeah. yeah. Something that I do for Paired is, um, so I also manage the Paired Instagram sometimes as well. And something that I do is, um, I just keep a sticky or a note on my computer that has a list of hashtags exactly. that I commonly use and then I'll just keep adding to that or if ones kind of get um, tired out then I'll exchange them but um, basically it makes it just really easy as I'm writing a caption I can just go into the notes app or the sticky that I have on my computer and just copy and paste it. Exactly. I also do the commenting <laughs> trick too because I don't like having that cloud of yeah. hashtags at the bottom. It doesn't look great. Yeah. Um, looks a lot cleaner when you have it condensed in a, as a second comment. So that's a great tip. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we also got some questions about paid ads on, in, on social media. Um, this isn't something that we do at Rich Table or RT Registry, personally, for a variety of reasons. Um, but if it is something that you're interested in for your restaurant, I think that you know, there's a couple kind of basic best practices to follow. Some people asked what kinds of content are best for paid ads. Um, 
I think it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are general awareness about your restaurant, post a, you know, do an ad with a beautiful food photo because people are going to respond to that. People love food photos on Instagram. So if, you're, if your goal is just to get people to know who you are, what your restaurant is, that you exist, then I think posting beautiful food photos works. If you're promoting an event, then you know having the, the event kind of po poster or photo for the event, a link to tickets. Um, and when you're thinking about what your ad should be, think about, like I said, your goals, and then also uh, a call to action. So if your goal is awareness, a call to action can be to link to your website or to you know, check out our menu or check out our catering. If your goal is to sell tickets, link to the Eventbrite page and say, you know, buy tickets now. Just make sure that your, your content aligns with your goals. I think that you, know, you can post whatever kind of photo you want for an ad, but just make sure it makes sense for what you want to get out of that ad. You're investing money into this, so make sure it's a cohesive message with what you hope to accomplish. Yeah, and actually I have a pretty relevant stat about that. I was looking at, um, so there's a company called Statista that has a bunch of um, research on different industries. And basically it surveyed consumers and it asked, what makes you try a new restaurant? So the leading stat is that 68% of folks um, use word of mouth to decide whether or not to try out a new restaurant. Um, and so I think that is definitely the leading one, but, it would, but when it comes to actual digital marketing and social media, folks are looking for advertisements and special offers and event promotion as well. So those tend to be the most marketed things when folks are investing in social media. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I wanna move next into this very large question about influencers and whether you should work with them, are they necessary, how to work with them, how to get the most out of a partnership with an influencer, and kind of this whole world that is so huge mm -hmm. on Instagram specifically now and is blowing up more and more by the day. <laughs> um, we don't personally work with influencers very much at Rich Table or RT Rotisserie um, for a variety of reasons. At Rich Table, we already have a pretty strong brand, I guess you could say, on social media. We have over 42,000 followers. So for us at Rich Table to work with an influencer who has even 50,000 followers isn't going to do a lot for our business. Um, our territory, we worked with influencers a little bit when we first started. Um, or first open because we were, you know, just starting out and we're a new restaurant and we wanted to kind of gain awareness. But we picked, we were really choosy with who we worked with and made sure that people that we worked with were really, you know, excited about the restaurant and engaged and not just trying to get the next cool food photo and leave. Um, so we we're really picky. We didn't work with very many and it made a little bit more sense for our tier two three also because it's a lower price point. Rich, a dinner at Rich Table if you're comping a meal for an influencer is not necessarily cheap. Um, our tierotisserie is a, a slightly more affordable price point to give away a free meal. Um, another reason we don't tend to work with a lot of influencers at Rich Table is that influencers who would have more of an impact on our business there, who have you know, 50,000 followers or more, don't always work with someone just for a free meal. Um, if they have a ton of followers, they might have specific rates that they demand for certain projects. So it's not really in our budget at this time. And I think we're getting along okay without them at Rich Table. Um, RT Rotisserie, like I said, it worked at the beginning, but it's not part of our kind of ongoing strategy for Instagram. Um, I think if you do want to work with influencers, there's a variety of ways that you can and make it really effective. I think working with influencers when a restaurant is first opening is probably the most valuable time to partner with influencers or to throw an event for influencers um, because you you know you need awareness about your restaurant to get business and I think influencers can be really valuable in that sense. Um, I've done a few different versions of influencer events for various restaurants. Um, I worked with a restaurant here in San Francisco called Media Noche and it was a couple months after they opened they launched um, a brunch menu and so we had an event for influencers it was called a, a blogger brunch and we invited them into the restaurant um, a couple hours before it opened we had you know welcome mimosas for them we had 
two big family style tables set up and they could all sit together and take photos. And we only invited about 15 influencers to that brunch and they were really, you know, engaged. They take really beautiful photos and they're really like nice <laughs> people mm -hmm. to work with. And that whole weekend, Instagram from them was like flooded with stories and mm. posts and they were posting about the space because it's really beautiful and also the food. And that's one really great way to do it. Of course, events like these take time and financial resources. You're giving away food to a bunch of people at one time and you're taking your own personal time to kind of cater to them. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, on the flip side, when we opened our tea rotisserie, and we were working with a few influencers, we invited them in on a one-off basis, so not all at once for one event, um, but we kind of invited them in, we let them pick and choose the day and time they wanted to come in, we let them order whatever they wanted off the menu so that they were getting the exact experience that they wanted and that would work for them and their followers. Um, and it was a little tricky at our tier rotisserie because we're a walk-in only, no reservation restaurant, so to kind of have people come in with a reservation was a little bit um, challenging to do. And we had to obviously set the expectation that because we're a walk-in only restaurant, there may not be a table ready for them exactly when they got there, but we would do their best, do our best to seat them um, as cl close to their preferred time as possible. But we also had to make sure that one of the owners was there to you know, welcome them in and kind of chat with them as they ate and make sure that they had a really personalized experience. So while an event, is also you know costly and takes time that took time as well because it was more personal and um, a lot more organization went into that in terms of scheduling and setting calendar reminders and things like that but i think those are two great ways that you can work with influencers if there's an influencer who's reached out to you who expresses genuine interest about your restaurant and just you know is a huge fan really wants to work with you isn't you know charging you a high rate or just wants you know a meal out of it? Use your discretion. Um, if you're a new restaurant starting out, it might be really worth it. If they have a lot of followers, you know that post can be seen by a lot of people, and then people will want to come and take similar photos at your restaurant or come try it. So it can be a really really valuable tool. Um, you just kind of have to think about what works for your style of restaurant, what you can afford, um, whether you can afford a couple free meals to give away or throwing a, a small private party for influencers, or if you have the money to spend on, you know, an influencer who has specific rates that they charge. If you can afford that and you think that it's an influencer who has a lot of engagement, then by all means, I think you can go for it. I think if it is an influencer who's charging for their services beyond just a free meal, ask to see a media kit. The influencers who have a lot of followers probably have them. They'll tell you, what, you know, where their followers are located. Are they male, female? Are they part of your key demographic or they have totally separate interests? And then, you know, how engaged they are. They'll also hopefully have information about that that they can share with you so that you can kind of decide if it is really worth your time and your money. Um, if you're just throwing an event, you know, I think it is a good way to keep the buzz going and to generate buzz for a you know, a, a restaurant revamp, a new chef, a new menu, brunch, happy hour, some kind of special promotion. It can be a really fun way to kind of generate that buzz when you start a program like that or when you're opening a restaurant. Yeah, so th those are really great tips. And I influencers are becoming pretty huge. And so yeah. um, it's an interesting kind of new emerging uh, channel for marketing. And right now, I think it can be pretty fast and loose. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have questions that I know you talked about vetting someone who has a genuine interest in your restaurant. Are there certain questions or things to look out for as a restaurant operator to really suss that out? Yes, I get a lot of emails from influencers um, who want to work with Rich Table, who have heard about it for, you know, from a publication or a friend or, you know, we've been around for a few years, we've gotten some accolades, they've heard about it, they're excited to try it. So I get a lot of emails from influencers wanting to work with us. I've gotten a lot of emails that I can tell I was BCC'd on an email to a lot of other restaurants, a lot of other PR people. In the email, they don't even mention the name Rich Table. They just say, I'm excited about your restaurant. <laughs> and I can tell that they're sending this exact same email to a lot of people. I always say no to those because if they can't take the time to send a personalized email and like one sentence about what they're excited about with Rich Table, 
or you know anything about the restaurant that interests them, then it's probably not worth our time. They're probably traveling to your city and they're sending this email to every single restaurant they've heard of in San Francisco or New York yeah. or wherever you yeah. are. And I don't think that they're going to be as interested in a producing quality content for us and be in like being a good partner. So I think if someone has really taken the time, again, we don't really ever work with influencers at Rich Table, but at RT Rotisserie, if someone has taken the time to reach out, they, you know, we're such a big fan, we love the cauliflower, you know, we want to do this particular type of contest or promotion with you guys, what do you think? You know, we might, we'll consider it because they actually care and they're probably going to take the time to take really beautiful photos and write nice captions and like actually, you know, do the work that is valuable in working with influencers. But if someone is BCCing me on an email about our restaurant, then <laughs> I, I'm going to say no. Right. Um, so I think that's one way to vet them is if they actually seem interested. And another way I think is asking for the media kit and seeing what their engagement is. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Putting the name of the restaurant is so small, but yeah. you'd be so shocked at how many people just don't do that. Totally. Um, totally. And then in your experience, so I know you mentioned that sometimes influencers um, are satisfied with getting a comped meal, but have mm -hmm. you encountered other uh, like payment structures when it comes to influencers? Like do they charge, I guess, like a rate per post? How do you navigate payment with influencers? Yeah, we so again, we don't work with influencers who charge certain rates per posts, um, just because giving a free meal is already, I think, should be pretty sufficient when it comes to a restaurant. We're not a huge brand with a lot of money. Restaurants have very small margins. So I think to ask a restaurant to pay a thousand dollars for an Instagram story is a little crazy. Um, <laughs> and I have been asked that, um, which is not in our budget. Um, should probably isn't in any restaurant's budget, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are plenty of in influencers who have rates for a post in their feed. They have separate rates for each individual Instagram story. And I just, I don't, even if that gets, you know, 2000 views, I just don't see a lot of value in paying for one Instagram story that's going to be gone in 24 hours or they could delete mm -hmm. five hours later. Right. Um, if it's an influencer who really has this huge following and you think is really worth your time to work with and you want to spend the money, then, you know, make sure it's a valuable person to work with and that they, their engagement is high enough. But if you want to pay for one single post, again, I don't think it's worth it. Every restaurant's a little bit different. Um, but for, to pay for a post that lives in the feed forever, I think is more valuable than paying for an Instagram story that goes away. Even if they say I'll save it to their highlights, I just, I don't think that it's worth paying money for that. Um, but yeah, I have encountered many people who, who charge for those specific services and charge for each story slide. Um, mm -hmm. But we just, it's not in our personal mm -hmm. <laughs> strategy or budget. Um, um, we also got asked if, if Instagram or social media should be your number one PR tool. Um, I think that social media is a huge tool and obviously the stats are there to back it up. It's extremely valuable for restaurants to pursue, but I don't think it should be your only tool when it comes to PR. I think that it's best to take a fully integrated approach. Um, and a quick example of that, when we launched the Rich Table Cookbook in September, we, we used every resource available to us. Um, we kind of ramped up social media about the book. We sent out newsletters to our email list. We put content on our website, like recipes and links to buy the book. We did contests, we did giveaways, we did co-promotional marketing um, with different brands that we mentioned in the cookbook. Um, we put check uh, postcards on every check presenter and also at our rotisserie and every to-go bag. It, we did everything that we could. We also did traditional PR, like pitching stories and sending press releases and going on podcasts and things like this and setting up a whole book tour. But I think that as much as you can and as much as you have time for, you should do as much as possible. I don't think that only focusing on Instagram or only focusing on traditional PR, or only focusing on you know one of these areas is going to necessarily give you the results you want. But I think if you're combining all of those things at the same time into a really integrated campaign, 
can be really valuable and will get the buzz going much more than just focusing on one. Um, we also got a lot of questions about budgeting for social media and how it affects you know, staffing and payroll. Um, obviously for me, I'm on staff at Rich Table and RT Rotisserie, so I'm on payroll. I'm not a you know, freelancer, I'm not at an agency, so it was a big investment for a restaurant to hire someone specifically to do this. It's not something every restaurant can do. I feel extremely fortunate that they were able to kind of take that leap and invest in me um, on their team. Um, it's, it depends what you have the budget for. If you have the budget for a PR agency, which can go from anywhere from around 5,000 a month up, then that can be a really helpful tool. If you don't have quite that budget, um, there's a lot of freelancers out there who work on smaller retainers or project bases. Um, there's also, you know, you don't, not every restaurant needs PR forever. Some restaurants, it's only beneficial at the, at the very beginning when they're opening to get the buzz going and then they kind of are on autopilot from there. So you don't need someone in-house or an agency or a freelancer necessarily for the entire lifespan of your restaurant. It might be helpful and you might you know, want to invest in that, but there are other ways to kind of get around that and make sure that it's um, you know, at least helpful at the very beginning. Um, another thing in terms of the, the busy restaurant tour and how do they fit this into their schedule, if you don't have the budget to hire someone full-time or work with an outside source, See if someone on your staff wants to pitch in from time to time. Um, before I started at Rich Table and Arturo Tisserie, a server at Arturo Tisserie there was super interested in social media and was helping with the Instagram account there and posting and doing stories. And, you know, it was kind of cool to see them, A, step up and take ownership of a new project. And also it's a great resource. So, again, you'd have to figure out what budgeting looks like on your end if you are able to compensate that person for that extra time and energy that they're putting into this project or if it's just kind of a thing that they're excited about that they want to do but if someone on your team has expressed interest in it like use them as a resource and they can be really helpful they're there all day anyways you know they're seeing <laughs> the cool things that are going on so um i think it's it can be it can be done by you know everyone pitching in a little bit here and there too without having to hire an outside source mm -hmm. So let's say I am more of like a mom and pop kind of restaurant. Mm -hmm. I don't really have the means or budget to go after an agency or hire a freelancer. Um, what are your thoughts when it comes to PR? Because I think it's mm -hmm. a little bit easier to find someone on your staff who is interested in social media and posting because um, whether we like it or not, social media is so pervasive these days. Yeah. I think PR is a little bit more specialized. And so yeah. how do you think um, like a smaller operation can go about um, utilizing that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and it is a much bigger project. I think Instagram can be done a little bit more on the fly, whereas traditional PR, I think, does require a little bit more time and attention and expertise. Mm -hmm. But I think if you befriend a couple key journalists in your city. You know, most major cities, um, Eater, the website has a big presence. So befriend, you know, the main reporter there or the main editor there and at least, you know, check in with them every once in a while. Say hi and tell them what you're up to. Not everything that you're up to is going to lead to a story, but, you know, just keeping in contact with people like that or, you know, the main reporter at your local newspaper um, and just kind of, you know, keeping in touch with them, forming a small relationship. Maybe you don't have the time or the resources to invest in relationships, you know, with people at Bon Appetit or the New York Times. But um, I think if you can form a relationship with a few local journalists, then that, that's half the battle with PR is that they know you and they will open your email when they see your name in the inbox. And I think it's it can be done, you know, pretty easily on your own if you if you invest a little bit of time into that if you aren't comfortable writing you know big press releases that's okay just send them an email and tell them you know your news or what you're up to and you know kind of continue the conversation from there but i think it's it's really worthwhile to form a relationship with some of these people and that's mm -hmm. you know there's your kind of pr component there i think right. Not every restaurant, if you're especially if you're a mom and pop, is necessarily going to make it into a magazine like Bon Appetit. There's thousands of restaurants that are, you know, wanting to be in that magazine, and it's not always going to happen. So I think if you can at least get
get your local press to um, to know what you're up to, that's that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said too because you were just saying about how um, it's a great idea to always maintain a relationship with your local journalists. I think too another um, kind of simple thing too is engaging with the folks who come into your restaurant because you you never know who mm -hmm. knows who or who does what. So that's um, totally. yeah a great thing to just keep in mind. Um, and what are your thoughts on more like in-person events? So I don't know if uh, Rich Table or RT Rotisserie does this, but something like industry night, do you have any experience with those yeah. types of events? Um, we don't really do events um, along those lines, but Mondays in San Francisco tend to be kind of industry nights where a lot of restaurants are closed. Um, and so, you know, chefs will have the night off for once and, you know, once a week and they will, um, they'll come in and they'll, you know, sit at the bar. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that what we do, rather than having events for industry night or something like that, we, um, we always make sure at Rich Table that we're asking people how they heard about us, where they're from, what they do. And if someone says they're a chef, you know, we'll take care of them. We want them to feel comfortable. We want chefs to want to come and eat with us. So I think when it comes to industry nights, it's more about um, the personal experience you're getting at the restaurant rather than a specific event. But absolutely, if you have the resources and you want to put the energy into having a specific like late night happy hour for industry folks or, you know, once a week special or something like that, then I think it can be really valuable because I think that at, for sure in San Francisco and probably in other cities as well, the chef community is very small or restaurant community in general is very small and everyone talks and everyone knows each other. And so if someone from, you know, a similar restaurant or a, even a competitor or whoever has a great experience at your restaurant and then they tell all their other server friends or chef friends about it, then it kind of keeps that industry vibe going and people want to come and hang out at your restaurant on their night off. Cool. So it looks like we're getting a couple PR related questions that are oh. coming in. The first one is about whether or not you think it's appropriate to ask uh, to ask a journalist specifically to come in and uh, check out the restaurant and then write reviews on your behalf. What is the accepted protocol here? So almost every journalist will say no. <laughs> um, they will not, like, if you ask them to come in and review your restaurant, that's not a good sign. Um, they are going to come in and review whatever restaurant they want to come in and review. I think it's acceptable to ask them to come in and have a meal on you, um, you know, and come check out what you're up to, or if you have a new happy hour brunch, new dish, new menu, whatever it is, it's totally acceptable to invite them to come in and dine. Um, I think you have to set the expectation that if you're inviting them in, you should probably be footing the bill. Um, but never ever ask a restaurant or a, a writer, excuse me, to come in and review your restaurant. Um, they have their own assignments that their editor is assigning them, or if they're, you know, their own, they're a writer slash editor, they're going to do their own thing. So I wouldn't ever ask anyone to come in and review, but absolutely ask them to come in and check out what you're up to. Um, reviews tend to be kind of the sort of secret thing and no one wants to know who's reviewing what or when someone's coming in. And most reviewers, well, may, maybe not be anonymous and um, they want to kind of have a very authentic honest experience at your restaurant and if you're inviting them to come in to review it then they're not getting the same experience that everyone else might get when they come in to eat with you um, so that's why most people are not going to come in on a scheduled review that you ask them to do they're yeah. going to do it on their own time mm -hmm. makes sense yeah and then another question about PR we're getting is um, what are the other sort of newsworthy moments that a uh, restaurant can use to capture PR yeah um, I think there's a lot of different stories out there. I think you have to kind of take a step back from what you do every single day at the restaurant yourself and think about what do people get excited about? What do people respond to? Is there a dish that is like your signature dish? Is there a dish that people always take photos of or always ask about or always want to know about and kind of use that up to your advantage? You know, you can pitch recipe stories. That's not necessarily newsworthy especially if you've had it on your menu for a while but it can be a really cool story for a magazine or a website or a blog to write about um, for rich table we have a couple signature dishes like our sardine chips and our porcini donuts that always tend to get a lot of attention so i think if you have a really interesting recipe that's something that 
people aren't doing or an ingredient that you're using that you don't see other restaurants using, that's a story or it can be. Um, so I think pitching, you know, try to keep things seasonal. So if it's spring is coming up, think about what recipes you're going to be working with for spring or what ingredients you're excited about. And you can pitch recipe stories like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's always great to have like an event or something new happening. But if it's, if there isn't anything new happening, think about what you're doing in the kitchen that you're super excited about or no one else seems to be doing. And hopefully that'll get a writer's attention as, as well. Great. And then we have another question about um, going back to Instagram and content on Instagram. Do you have recommendations for making uh, your restaurant or food more Instagram worthy? We were chatting about avocado toast, but I don't know mm -hmm. if from your purview, there are um, upcoming trends where uh, you're seeing more engagement. Yeah, I think, well, that's, it's hard because I think some of the trends that influencers tend to gravitate towards, which is like holding the ice cream cone in front of the pool wall <laughs> right. or, you know, holding a dish out in front of a mural, things like that. That's, I don't, I don't think that you need to cater to the Instagram trends. Um, I think if that's the kind of restaurant you have and you want to go for it, okay. Um, but I think just making sure that your food looks really delicious and is, you know, colorful and beautiful on the plate. I think, you know, we have, we have new dishes at Rich Table all the time and I try to take photos of them every time they come out um, every day. But some of them I just, once you play around with the lighting and stuff, it may not look that great in your feed or it doesn't translate to a photo. It doesn't mean the dish isn't delicious, it is, but it just like sometimes doesn't fully translate to visually delicious. Um, so I think you have to make sure that whatever you're putting out there just looks super edible and delicious. I think we've seen enough of the like rainbow bagels and all <laughs> these like crazy concoctions mm -hmm. that, okay, that's a cool photo that's fun to have in your feed, but is it really that tasty? I don't know. Um, but I think if you're focusing on like just putting out really beautiful photos of delicious looking food, that's a great way to do it. I do all of our photos uh, with my iPhone. I'm not a professional photographer, but make sure that you're, you know, using the best light you can find in the restaurant and um, put it on a beautiful plate or, you know, kind of set a scene on a table with a wine glass and a, you know, some forks and knives mm -hmm. and kind of make it look appealing, make it look like someone's already sitting there eating it. Or, you know, I think just having beautiful food is kind of the first step um if it looks messy on the plate or it's all one color or you know it just doesn't look like something you want to eat then it's not going to really translate to a great photo that people respond to mm -hmm. great uh so we are coming up on 1 p.m uh, pacific time but i wanted to make sure we addressed the last section that you had which is the roi piece of social media um I, we got a lot of questions about that too and i think it's a pretty crucial uh, thing to discuss if folks are going to put in that investment. How do we make sure that uh, people do see the results that come out of those efforts? Absolutely. And I think this, at least when it comes to PR, is sometimes a tricky subject that is hard to, it's hard to quantify PR. Um, traditionally, metrics like impressions have been used to decide whether PR is effective or not. I think that's kind of archaic at this point. I don't think that's a really good indicator of whether PR is working. Um, I think a lot of people also look at the number of pieces that come out about your restaurant, how much coverage you're getting. And I think that's super valuable, but I think also think about the right kind of coverage that your restaurant should be getting. Are the journalists getting the messages right? You know, have, has your PR firm like fully explained who you are and what you do and what makes you special to these writers that are writing about you? I think that's a really good way to, to measure that. Are they getting the key messages right? Um, and then, yeah, I think number of articles because can be a really good indicator if your PR firm is doing a good job or if your in-house person is doing a good job. But I think for me, I think about the right kind of coverage um, and the more valuable outlets to, to work with. Um, I think also if you're putting, you know, efforts towards social media and Instagram and um, you have these big initiatives out there that you're working on, like think again about what your goals are. So if your goal is to sell, you know, more of this particular dish or to have more people at happy hour, if your goal is like just getting butts in seats, like you have to look at your own numbers internally and see, okay, from when we started the social media camp or before the social media campaign to when the social media campaign 
ended, so to speak, did we see more people come in for happy hour? And you have to kind of just gauge that by your internal numbers um, to decide whether it's been effective. Mm -hmm. Great, um, cool. So we are at 1 p.m. and um, we got through most of the questions that we saw. Um, so with that, I wanted to just say thank you, Lindsay, so much for coming in and sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, so for folks who are still online, once you exit the webinar, you're gonna get a link to complete a survey. And it just asks um, information that's related to um, what content you liked, what you'd like to see in the future. So if folks could take a couple moments to take uh, that survey, that would be amazing. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we're producing the best content for everyone. Uh, we are trying to maximize that ROI on the content that we are <laughs> producing for you. <laughs> so please, uh, please fill that out. Um, and then lastly, um, this recording, uh, our webinar will also be recorded. So I can also send out a um, file on this afterwards for folks who couldn't make it. And if you want to refer to information later. Um, so great. All right, thank you so much. Thank and you. we're signing off. <laughs> Bye. Bye.